Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles where today we're featuring a ship that I don't think I've featured in a very, very long time. The good old Stalingrad, available only for steel in the armory and once considered completely overpowered. So much so that tournaments were forced to start limiting the number of Stalingrads that teams could take into competitive World of Warships tournaments. Wargaming, of course, with their finger on the pulse as always, soon took note of the number of Stalingrads that people were trying to get into competitive gaming, and decided to reduce the number of Stalingrads that people were queuing up for in tournaments by introducing the Petra Pavlovsk. An equally, in fact some would say, even more overpowered ship that didn't require you to farm obscene amounts of steel which you could simply unlock in the tech tree. As always, Wargaming don't fix problems, they just move them around a bit. Oh, do you remember when everyone was complaining that the Soviet Tier 10 battleship, the Kremlin, was way too tanky and needed nerf and Wargaming said, yep, we've heard your concerns and we're going to address them when nerfing its mid-range anti-aircraft fire. <laughs> oh, Wargaming, don't ever change. <laughs> anyway. So, sailing the Stalingrad for us today... I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce his name. If this is the EU server, it could be Jacob Blop, it could be Jakob Block. I, I, you know, I'm just going to call him Jake. Good old Jake. Distant relative of Dave, who we haven't seen around here in quite some time, but don't worry, I'm sure he'll be making a reappearance very, very soon. So what exactly was it about the Stalingrad that made it so ridiculously good? Well, there's a couple of things. 25% torpedo damage reduction, 12 kilometer range radar, pretty good armor, an absurd amount of hit points, even for a tier 10 cruiser, but it was mostly the guns, or more specifically, the armor-piercing shells that they fired. The Stalingrad's 305mm armor-piercing shells get improved auto-bounce angles. What this means is, even if the target is angled, the shells will not automatically ricochet unless they start hitting at an angle that exceeds 65 degrees. Now, in case you're wondering just exactly how significant a buff to the armor-piercing shells this is, the standard angles for armor-piercing ricochets are, between a flat broadside of 0 degrees and 45 degrees, there is zero chance for ricochet. Between 45 and 60 degrees, there is a chance to ricochet. And between 60 and 90 degrees, regular armor-piercing shells will always ricochet, unless they overmatch the thickness of armor that they're striking, but that's a completely different matter. The important thing to note here is that normal armor-piercing shells will start having a chance to ricochet from an angle of 45 degrees and up. But the Stalingrad shells don't even start having a chance to ricochet until the angle exceeds 65 degrees, and that's huge. And what it basically means is, if you're angling against the Stalingrad, and you think you're safe, you're probably not. Angle some more, because they can hit you really hard. The armor-piercing shells do a lot of damage. And they also overmatch up to 21 millimeters of armor, which is real bad news if you're in a British light cruiser, because it basically means the Stalingrad can citadel and overmatch you from any angle. And it also means that it's got enough overmatch to safely fire an armor piercing salvo rather than a high explosive salvo against just about any destroyer in the game, because they'll over penetrate and they'll do 10% damage, but they won't bounce. Standard tactic for cruiser captains that find themselves being rushed by a destroyer is to, well, if they have armor piercing loaded, just accept that you're hardly going to do any damage to the destroyer. Or, if you're lucky enough to have the expert loader skill, quickly switch back to high explosive with a 50% reduction in reload. Stalingrad captains don't really have to worry about switching ammunition types when faced with a destroyer charging headlong towards them, because even if you're firing at him at what would normally be automatic ricochet angles, if he's coming straight at you, bow in, you overmatch his armour. So the shells don't even do a ricochet check. Anything that hits him is going to penetrate. Possibly over-penetrate, but it's never going to bounce. The Stalingrad's downside is the high explosive damage per minute, which is pretty bad. On paper, the high explosive shells don't look that terrible. 33% chance of setting fire to a target with 4,500 maximum damage per shell, but you need to put that into perspective. These are 305mm guns. The Shimakaze, a tier 10 destroyer, has 127mm guns, and they do 2,150 maximum high explosive shell damage. 
just under half the damage for slightly less than a third of the calibre, and a much faster rate of fire. If you ever find yourself firing high explosive in the Stalingrad, there's usually something gone badly, badly wrong. And usually it's your choice to switch to the high explosive ammunition. Especially with the improved auto bounce angles of the armor piercing shells, it's almost always going to be better to fire the AP. So that's it. That's, that's the only real downside to the Stalingrad. Bad high explosive. A problem that can be fixed by just not firing high explosive. Well, yeah, kind of. Well, I mean, there are other downsides. She doesn't have hydro. Her concealment's terrible. It's worse than some tier 10 battleships. The ship handling is pretty bad as well. All of which can make her quite vulnerable to destroyers. But her 305mm armor-piercing shells will never ricochet off a destroyer's plating, and she does have 25% torpedo damage reduction, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta take the rough with the smooth, I suppose. I don't think anybody would seriously argue that the Stalingrad is a brokenly overpowered ship anymore, but it's still pretty damn strong. Now, up to this point, you could quite easily be forgiven for thinking, Jingles, why are we watching this? He, nothing's really happened, he hasn't really done anything. And yeah, but there's a very good reason for that. Yeah, he's camping behind an island in the centre of the map, but from this position he has been able to trade shots with some enemy ships, and even in this position of relative safety he's already lost a third of his health. From here he's in a strong position to use that 12km radar to support his teammates both here in the middle, of which there's only really that destroyer over there, but also his teammates to the left and right. The only reason he hasn't actually used his radar yet is because it would have been completely pointless. If you look at Capture Circle Alpha, which has just been flipped, there's a Des Moines in there, not a destroyer, and he's in a nice comfortable position behind the island. And he has plenty of fire support on anybody that tries to push further south, namely this Smolensk who's in an equally strong position providing spotting on Jake's teammates over there to the west who don't really appear to have much of an idea of where they're going to go or what they're going to do because if they were to push further south not only would the Smolensk be able to crossfire them but he's also spotting everybody for the other enemy ships down to the south. Anybody trying to push forward at this point and the Oster Yotland's having a go he doesn't know there's a Des Moines over there doesn't he? Maybe his radar's on cooldown. We'll see how it all works out. At the moment, both teams have lost one ship each. And Jake, seeing the Osteotland going for it, is moving up to support. Pops the radar, anticipated catching the Mogador in that position, which is the only reason he switched to the high explosive shells. Although given the 21mm of overmatch on the armor-piercing shells of the Stalingrad, the armor-piercing would probably have done the same job. And for a few seconds, for the second time in this match, because his team did score the first kill, Jake's team go ahead on points. The Oster Yotland is now contesting the cap circle at Alpha. Pretty much nobody on either team has bothered with the central cap at Bravo yet, and his team are now pushing the cap circle at Charlie. This is about as good as it's going to get for Jake's team for the entire course of the remainder of this battle. Sensing an opportunity, Jake continues to push forward in support of his teammates over there on the west who are likewise pushing forward, except not all of them are. The Atago's heading the wrong way, the Oster Yotland has quit the cap circle at Alpha, the cruiser who is trying to flip the cap at Charlie has just been sunk, which means the enemy team retain control of Alpha, and even though both teams have suffered three losses, it's that capture point at Alpha with the steady trickle of incoming points that is going to give the enemy team the upper hand. Jake, of course, is kind of committed, he can't turn around and back out now. He needs to get into cover behind this island. This will give his radar some additional coverage, but he still kind of has the same problem they had earlier behind the island up to the north. It's all well and good using the radar to spot targets, but if those targets are hidden behind islands, nobody can actually shoot at them. And the position of the Smolensk and the Des Moines are the same. Any of his teammates to the west who try to push forward aren't going to be able to shoot at them until they're caught in a crossfire. A 12km radar is an important and very strong tool, but it's completely useless if you don't have anybody on your team who's in a position to take advantage of the spotting that it provides. And the team have just lost another ship. There is still only a one kill difference between the two teams. Things don't actually look that bad, and there are a few enemy ships, like the Tallinn over there on 500 health, just ripe for the killing. The problem is that despite the improved armor-piercing auto-bounce angles, 
at that kind of range, his shots are basically coming in from directly above. So if he's unlucky enough to strike the Talon's belt at that kind of angle, it's still going to ricochet, which is what it just did. And then it just did it again. Luckiest Talon EU 2022. His teammates to the west are making a sort of half-hearted effort to push further south, but they're still running into the crossfire between the Des Moines and the Smolensk. Most importantly, the Smolensk has just burnt down the Grosser Kerr first and sunk in with fires, as well as the Minnesota and the Tallinn down to the south. The team's point position is starting to look really, really bad. They've just lost the Des Moines, they're down to 80 points. The Petra Pavlovsk over at Charlie has just given up trying to flip it. He really, really needs to sink this Talon, and he needs to do it now, or this match could be over in seconds if they lose another ship, or two. He does get the Talon. This very briefly puts his team back up to triple figures as far as point score is concerned. This briefly buys the team some breathing space, and then things do start to look better when the Atago manages to get some of those torpedoes to connect with the Minnesota down to the south. Of course, the Des Moines over there then finishes off the Osteotland and his team goes straight back down to 110 points again. Here is where Jake once again spots an opportunity. With nobody to spot and crossfire for, the Smolensk has abandoned the position to the south of the island just ahead. And you'd think that the friendly Amagi over to the west would be capable of dealing with the Des Moines on very, very low health by himself. It's here where Jake suffers a really nasty lag spike, but he comes out of it okay, he didn't collide with the island up ahead. Jake, reasoning that the Amagi over there bow in against the Des Moines with twice the Des Moines health and 16 inch guns that can overmatch the Des Moines armoured nose and citadel it from the front would be quite capable of taking care of a tier 10 cruiser. Plus, there's nothing Jake can actually do to help because the Des Moines, since he's capable of thinking and breathing at the same time, has an island between him and Jake, so he only has to fight one opponent at the same time, and does in fact sink the Amagi. Jake's team are now down to 50 points, and he's got an extremely unwelcome Des Moines on his flank, he's probably reversing right now to try to do the same thing to Jake. There's nothing Jake can do about that right now. He needs to sink that Smolensk, who's motoring south under the cover of his smokescreen. But, 12 kilometer radar. Scratch one Smolensk, Jake's team back up to the dizzying heights of 85 points. <laughs> Fortunately, the Des Moines has not yet reversed into a position where he could spank Jake's broadside. And it's probably just the radar, although it doesn't last very long, that's preventing him from doing so. This is going to give Jake time to angle against any fire coming in from the Des Moines, now to his rear, and attempt to get that Neptune. The Neptune is smoked up, and he's probably launched torpedoes, and the Stalingrad doesn't have hydro, and he's shooting. Despite the fact that he is clearly, oh yep, and there is torpedoes, but despite the fact that the Neptune, judging by his tracer, is clearly perched right on the edge of that smoke screen, Jake holds his fire because he wants to be sure he's going to kill the Neptune. Because the team have just lost their Petra Pavlosk, they're down to 35 points. The Des Moines, who probably shouldn't be able to, but looks like he probably is going to sink the Atago, and if that happens, it's game over. The enemy team have two of the three caps, and if Jake were to just fire now based on where he thinks the Neptune is, without any guarantees of scoring any hits, before the Des Moines kills the Atago, it could cost them the match and his patience and discipline is rewarded, ensuring the kill on the Neptune just when his team needed it, pushing them back up to the dizzying heights of 70 points. They could really use another kill. Actually, they could use a lot more kills. How are things going to the rear between the... Oh dear, that doesn't look good, does it? <laughs> and the Atago goes down, putting Jake's team on 20 points, two ships against five. But Jake does have some shots in the air. They're just going to take a while to get there. And he's got the Yamato. There's the Kraken unleashed. Not much cause for celebration. They're still 80 points away from losing. They still have no caps and they're still outnumbered two to one. He gets a bit of a breathing space here as he takes advantage of the Neptune smokescreen. But there ain't nobody winning this one by hiding. The Indomitable gets an airstrike in. He gets some shots off at the Indomitable. 
But there is still another Yamato out there somewhere, and good hits on the Indomitable. That's actually quite surprising. He's ready for the Indomitable's return attack now, of course. He is in a Tier 10 artillery cruiser with his defensive fire consumable up. He's reinforced his anti-aircraft sector. That is just the Tier 8 carrier against the Tier 10 artillery cruiser. And the Indomitable does only get two aircraft per strike package. And... The Indomitable spanks him anyway. <laughs> that hardly seems fair. <laughs> Slightly bigger problems right now, of course. The enemy Yamato. I think it's fairly safe to say that Jake was sweating bullets at this point, so his first salvo at the Yamato was not aimed particularly well. But while the Yamato's 18-inch guns can overmatch up to 32mm of plating, and the Stalingrad's bows are actually only 25mm thick, they are covered at least in the lower half by a 50mm icebreaker, behind which is an angled citadel. So it's actually the tier 8 carrier that's doing more damage to him, and once Jake realises that he's not in immediate danger of dying from the Yamato, and he's getting support from his carrier, he makes the shots count. And there's the Kraken unleashed. In all the excitement, I forgot to point out that um, I'm not saying carriers are overpowered or anything, but the Pobeda, the only surviving teammate that Jake has, just managed to get himself a close quarters expert and sink the enemy Yost the Yotland with his secondary gun batteries. The team, such as it is, is now once again in triple figure points, but there's no way they're winning this on points. Even if they were to take all three of the cap circles, there just isn't enough time. There isn't even enough time for them to take the cap circles. They have to kill everything. Jake says to the carrier, get the Des Moines, which would normally be a suicidal proposition for a tier eight carrier against a tier 10 AA cruiser. But this is World of Warships and tier eight carriers, well, they don't have an easy time against tier 10s. Well, they shouldn't have an easy time against tier 10s. <laughs> Oh, here comes the Indomitable again, once again. I mean, he's got no choice but to attack Jake, but once again, his Tier 8 aircraft, with their two aircraft strike package, just flying straight through his concentrated anti-aircraft fire, gouging great chunks out of his health pool with his high explosive bombs through Jake's 50 millimeters of deck plating, while casually abusing the border humping bug, which causes your ship's gun's lock to be confused, which caused Jake's previous salvo to miss entirely, although to be fair to the carrier player under the circumstances, there's not really a lot else he can do. Jake closing in as the friendly carrier unleashes wave after wave of aircraft against the Des Moines, which, let me remind you, with its anti-aircraft defensive fire consumable up, has the strongest AA in the game, which of course means that the Tier 10 anti-aircraft cruiser stands no chance whatsoever against the Tier 8 aircraft carrier. Meanwhile, at the other end of the map, while the Indomitable here, the Tier 8 carrier on the enemy team, has probably done more damage to Jake than any other single ship on the enemy team. Actually, there's no probably about it. That carrier did 20,000 damage to him. And Jake has done 25,000 damage to aircraft and shoots down two and one of those is a spotter plane. <laughs> but despite all of that, at this point, with a minute and a half to go, the result is fairly inevitable. So that's a win for Jake, with nearly 2 million potential damage tanked, 190,000 damage done to warships, sinking seven of them, 25,000 damage done to tier eight aircraft, enough to shoot one of them down. <laughs> Yeah, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that picture. Although, in the interest of fairness, impartiality and full disclosure, it's probably only right to point out that the 11,000 damage that he took during the course of that battle from high explosive shells did knock out two of his 76 anti-aircraft guns. So yeah, that, that seems legit. Either way, I'm sure you're all gonna have fun with that one in the comments, but what's important is that despite being reduced to 20 points and two ships against five, Somehow, Dave and Jammo in the carrier managed to find a way to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat 
while the enemy team were busy snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. Congratulations, and I hope you all enjoyed it, because that's it for today. And as always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.